Welcome to the Glenn Mercer Show, where we talk all things vegan. If you're not already vegan, no worries, we'll get you there. If you are, tune in for health advice, information on climate change, and all the damage done by our most destructive industry, animal agriculture. We'll also talk cooking, theater, film, and culture. My two reasons for starting this podcast, to entertain, to inform, and to make people vegan. Oh, that's three. Shit. Hello and welcome to the Glenn Mercer Show. You could find us across all your favorite podcast platforms. You could find us on YouTube. And please remember to subscribe. And you can find us at realmeneatplants.com, where there are some good blog posts. Uh, you should... Check out, check out that website, realmeneatplants.com. Today, we are going to make nutritional history. Uh, we are going to announce the discovery of the sixth macronutrient. This is important news. Uh, the history of macronutrients is that they used to say there are three macronutrients, fat, protein, and carbohydrate. And after a while, they wised up a little bit, and they said, actually, there are two more, water and fiber. Because basically, a macronutrient is what your body needs to absorb in order to live, and you need water and you need fiber to live. But today, we announce the sixth macronutrient, heretofore undiscovered, I have discovered it. The sixth macronutrient is optimism. And my guest today is the avatar of optimism. He's the man I turn to whenever I need a dose of optimism. My good friend, Dr. Silas Rao. Silas, welcome to the show. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you for that introduction. <laughs> Silas is, has just returned from England where he represented the side of truth in a debate at, at the Oxford Student Union. Tell us about that debate, Silas. Yeah, it was at the Oxford Union, which is, uh, which is actually separate from the Oxford Student Union. Oh, okay. Yeah. The Oxford Union. But is it run by students? It's run by students, yeah. Okay. It's run by students. It's a debating society. Okay. Whereas the Oxford Student Union is a governing Union, right? Okay. For student matters. I stand corrected. No problem. <laughs> so the Oxford Union is a debating society that was started 200 years ago by a group of rebels who wanted to talk about things that the professors did not want them to talk about, especially religion and, and politics were the main things. Uh -huh. And so they wanted to a place where they can openly talk about things that matter to them. Right. So they moved out and they started this uh, Oxford Union Debating Society in uh, 1823. And um, they've since been meeting every term uh, on the Thursday evening of every term. Right? So during the week, you know, so... This term, they had eight debates, and ours was the last debate of the term. So it was actually the last debate of the 200th year wow. of the Oxford Union. So, and the, the premise of the debate was what? The topic of the debate, the proposition was, this house would go vegan. Okay, And uh, there were four speakers on for the proposition and four speakers for the opposition. And the way the Oxford Union debates work, it's like a parliamentary format where um, a speaker for the proposition speaks first, and then the first speaker for the opposition speaks, and then we alternate uh, until there are only two speakers left. And then it's open to the floor for students to come and make their pitches, both for and against. Uh, it's interesting that this tradition began 200 years ago so mm -hmm. that the students can talk about the subjects of politics and religion, which are basically the two subjects not to talk about over dinner. Right. <laughs> and now, 200 years later, the topic is dinner. Right. What to have for dinner. 
Right. So your colleagues making the case for the vegan diet, and by the way, we will put in the show notes the link to uh, so that everyone could watch this debate. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen it yet because the link isn't available yet, uh, but it should be available by the time this, this airs. Um, so uh, your colleagues on the vegan side were, were who? Well, it was uh, Disha Hegde, the president of the Oxford Union uh, for the Michaelmas term, 2023. So she has been vegan for four years. And so she started the, um, the case for the proposition. Okay. And then the incoming president, uh, Hannah Edwards, who will be the president for the next term, uh, she started the case for the opposition. Okay, she so, was arguing that the this house would not go vegan. That's right, yeah. She was arguing that this house would not go vegan, how inconvenient it would be for the house, uh, how the milk has to be changed, you know, everything has to be changed, and, you know, um, our traditions are going to be overturned, et cetera, et cetera. So that was her case. That's the case she was making. The case anyway, she, against veganism was that it's inconvenient. Exactly. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. And, and that uh, reminds me of the name of Al Gore's climate presentation and inconvenient truth. That's right. <laughs> um, so, and then who spoke next for the side right. of good? I spoke for the side of good. So All I was right. the first uh, external speaker who spoke for the side of good, for, for the side of veganism, right? <laughs> for the proposition. Right. And, uh, and then Dr. David Rose spoke for the opposition. Okay. So we all got 10 minutes each. Okay. okay. We all got 10 minutes each. And after David, Dr. David Rose, it was Dr. Chidi uh, Mbauga, who spoke for the proposition. And he and is so a London-based physician? Yes, he's a London-based uh, lifestyle medicine physician. And uh, he has appeared on BBC and a lot of uh, you know, media. So he's very well spoken. And so he did the great job of you know representing the health aspect of why we need to go vegan. Okay. Uh, and then uh, the opposition, there was another student. Her name is Manon Hammond. And uh, she's a Welsh student, and she spoke for the opposition. And uh, and then the, it was open to the floor, and I think we had two speakers on either side, you know, who spoke from the floor. What about Joey Carbstrong? Yeah, after the floor speeches were oh, done, okay. Then Joey Carbstrong spoke for the proposition, and he made the ethical case for veganism. Okay. And then. Uh, Katie Hopkins got the last word, and so she spoke for the opposition. And um, yeah, she she was arguing why we shouldn't go vegan. The house should not go vegan. And and those who made the case against veganism, did it all boil down to the inconvenient argument? Uh, being vegan is inconvenient. Inconvenience, uh, culture, tradition, and uh, Katie Hopkins was actually trying to make the case that it's debilitating you know it will weaken human beings and we will we will all get short and <laughs> so i was actually going i mean i was nudging dr chidi and say get up and show her how tall you are <laughs> yeah. remind her how tall you are because he was taller than anybody else <laughs> now your granddaughter has she yeah. been vegan since birth yeah pretty much and is she yeah. is she taller now than she was then <laughs> She's up to my chin, you know, she's only right. 13 years old. All she's right. up to my chin, yeah. And I, I'm just amazed at how fast she's growing. <laughs> On a vegan diet, who knew? Right. Um, so uh, afterwards, there was a vote by the students, right? On who won the right. debate? Right. So and... there was a vote. And the way they conduct the vote, it's very interesting. Like all of us, we were all escorted out, all the speakers and, uh, you know, uh, we escorted out and we went to the uh, bar where we were supposed to wait for the results. And uh, and then they put a pole in the door, in the middle of the door, so that to the if you walk to the left of the door, you are voting nay. If you walk to the right of the door, you're oh. voting I. Okay. Is so, that the 200-year-old tradition? That's the 200-year-old tradition. Wow. Uh, 
I mean, the place is full of uh, memories and, you know, yeah. like, I think the, the days was the one that was used by Winston Churchill, you know, and stuff like that. Yeah, lots yeah. of memories, old memories in the place. So uh, it's an entire court that belongs to the Oxford Union. So there are lots of buildings that belong to the Oxford Union. Okay. So anyway, this this poll they put in the door, and then there are two students who are counting um, the both the S word and the no word. So there's one for the no word, one for the S word, and so they have designated who is going to do the counting, and uh, and then uh, they at the bar they announced it, and the and the and the result was the result was 112 to 84. The eyes have it. All right, so this house would go vegan in the language of the proposition. Exactly, this house so, would okay, go they, vegan. They, they use that tense would. Is the house going to go vegan? Are there going to be any changes? Well, unless there is another debate and, and then the house flips its mind, the house is going vegan, uh, from what I can Which tell. Which will that change the food in the cafeteria? What's, what, what's going to change? Well, the interesting thing was uh, the dinner we had uh, before the debates, and this is the tradition, right? So we we gather there at six thirty in the evening, and then we have some drinks, and then we have dinner, and then um, the debate starts at around eight o'clock. So the dinner was entirely vegan, uh huh, hundred percent vegan, okay, for everybody, uh huh, and that was part of the complaint that the the side for the opposition kept making. Uh -huh. <laughs> we had to eat this stuff, <laughs> right? And it was actually delicious stuff. I mean, it was, they had an eggplant dish as the main dish and uh, uh, soup and salad, you know, so, uh, and the dessert was also vegan. So, I mean, uh, you got a full taste of what vegan food, a vegan meal would look like uh, for those who were not used to that. And uh, and I think it was, they did a great job of presenting it. Okay. Um, I think the rationale was that the majority of people at the dinner were vegan, you know, therefore let's make it completely vegan. Okay. So, But that's the dinner before. Does anything change going forward at going, the Oxford Union? My understanding is that now uh, this is this is partly what uh, the incoming president was complaining about that she would have to change uh, the milk, uh, the the food. You, know, you won't get your bacon and egg sandwich for breakfast. You know <laughs> she was, that's what she was saying. That's that's and is that's that the, is that going to happen now? That's the no implication more... of uh, of the house would go vegan, right? Yeah. So uh, we are going to try and help her out. And, uh, you know, I'm going to write to her and say, is there anything you need? Any, any questions you have? You know, I'm happy to help you figure out how to do it. Okay. Uh, so they're going to do it. They're going to stop serving animal foods at the Oxford Union. At the Oxford Union. Yeah. That's my understanding. Okay. Yeah. That's my understanding. That will be wonderful. Now, there are some schools with cafeterias, colleges, mm -hmm. where they've made vegan the new default meal. Is right. that right? That's right. There are a lot of, there are, I think, three schools, according to the plant-based universities people, there are three universities that have, uh, where the students have asked for a 100% vegan campus uh, based on environmental grounds, you know, because, you know, the students recognize that this is their future. Right. And their future that that is being destroyed by the animal agriculture industry, and uh, and they want to reclaim their future. So, yeah. um, is this part of what gives you optimism? These kinds of changes on college campuses. Where do you where do you uh, get your optimism from? Well, see, my optimism comes from the fact that. Uh, uh, everything in this journey for me has been through sheer luck or through sheer you know coincidence or something or the other happens that I cannot explain and and I feel like I'm being led and I'm saying if I'm being led I'm obviously being led in the right direction you know 
So which means that it is going to happen and I'm just an instrument. I mean, I'm a systems engineer, right? So, so it's, someone's waking me up and saying, hey, I need some systems engineering <laughs> expertise <laughs> to, co to, come, to come to play here. And so, and that, so I'm saying, how can I contribute to making this happen? Well, you've uh, contributed, of course, by f founding climatehealers.org. Mm -hmm. And I advise all our listeners to check out climatehealers.org. And Silish knows more about the climate than anyone else I know. And I leaned on his expertise heavily in writing my book, Food is Climate. Um, do you see anything moving in the positive direction for the climate? Well, um, I see, you know, I see uh, a more open discussion of not only the food aspect of the climate, but all the other five planetary boundary violations uh, of, for which we know absolutely that going vegan is the right thing to do for that. You know, mm -hmm. there's absolutely no question about that for mm -hmm. the other five. And so it's, so the way the mainstream storytelling, which is basically all it is, right? So the story reporting and storytelling has been to ignore the other five planetary boundary transgressions, just focus on climate change, and then pretend that, that the only thing you need to do for that is fossil fuels. And I'm saying that this story is becoming so weak and so thin that, I mean, you've got to see through it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> With half a brain, we can see through it. And yeah. so they're trying to just make us you know, stick to the same economic growth paradigm and, and just go and go buy electric cars and um, uh, and then pretend that we have solved all the problems. <laughs> all right, let's run down what those five other planetary boundaries that they're ignoring are. Yeah, okay, number one, uh, freshwater use and freshwater change. Um, that's the least violated among all the six planetary boundary transgressions. And, and it turns out animal agriculture isn't very good for the water, is it? Absolutely. It's the worst, right? It's yeah. animal agriculture is one is an, an activity where you chop down forests and then plant grass or soybeans or whatever, you know, plant mostly plant, plant grass. So you converted so many of the forests into grasslands. And when you do that, you're going to turn fresh water into salt water uh, because you're going to reverse the water cycle of the planet. You know, yeah. um, which trees are very good at converting salt water into fresh water. Yeah. And uh, trees so, also contribute to rain through transpiration, right? Right. That's so that's what I mean. So they contribute to rain through transpiration. And along with the water vapor, they actually actually also send out microorganisms, uh, which become the nucleus for raindrop formation. So trees are literally creating the rain above themselves, okay? And so that, that what that does is uh, when you form uh, raindrops, you create a low pressure zone above the trees and then that allows the water vapor from above the ocean to get sucked up over the forest oh. and to create more rain for the trees. So it's not like the trees are just you know, sending water up and then bringing that back down. No, no, they're actually sucking water from over the ocean wow. <laughs> and bringing it on top of themselves. And they do that in, if they're part of a forest, right? This is what a forest does. A dense group of trees uh, can do that together. And so but when you chop down those forests and replace it with grass, then there'll be more microorganisms above the ocean than above land, and the cycle reverses. Right, so it'll then take the fresh water from um, from the ground and suck it up and pour, pour it over the ocean, so it converts fresh water to salt water. Uh, so, so we're losing fresh water and we're gaining hamburgers, so we can have heart attacks. Exactly, <laughs> it's not not a good deal. Not a good deal. So All that's right, the number so, one, you know. So that's water the first one. Is first, what's next? The the next is land system change. Uh, which is, you know, we are exceeded. We have exceeded how much land we can convert from forests to grasslands, 
and still maintain the viability of life on the planet, right? So life is literally dying out in front of our eyes because we have taken too much of the land for ourselves. And so when we go vegan, we can return 40% of the land back to nature and that would restore the land system change, um, planetary boundary transgression. So it will reverse it. Forty right? percent being the the uh, land surface that's being dedicated to grazing. Thirty-seven percent is for grazing, and then another six percent is for uh, crops. And I'm saying we probably have to, you know, keep three percent of that for the extra crops we have to grow right. for human consumption, and then the other three percent you can give back to nature. Right. So that's the way I come up with 40%. Yeah. Okay. So 40% of the land on earth is being dedicated to giving us heart attacks. Exactly. All right. So that's two down. What's next? The third is, of course, climate change. And that's the, that's the, that's the uh, fourth worst violation, uh, fourth worst right. transgression. It's not even number one. Okay. It's number four right. <laughs> out of the six. And um, and that, of course, when we restore the three trillion trees that we cut, I mean, you can calculate it. Clearly, you can reverse climate change, right? If the trees do half as much carbon sequestration as the other three trillion trees that are already on the planet, you right. can reverse And of climate course, change. when the trees come back, the soil comes back and the exactly. soil holds, is it more carbon than the trees? Yeah, the soil holds uh, uh, about a little bit more than twice as much carbon as the trees themselves. So the trees, there is above ground carbon and there is below ground carbon. And the below ground carbon is roughly the same amount as the above ground carbon. So that's in the roots, right? Yeah. And then the soil holds about twice as much as the tree right. itself. Yeah. And the worst enemy of the soil is animal agriculture. Exactly. Yeah. Man, There's the a... same darn profession keeps popping up but the, isn't that great though it's very convenient no it's so very once, convenient yeah, that's why very... i did a powerpoint once called the convenient truth we just <laughs> changed this one thing and we solve so many problems right yeah it's so it's in that sense it's it's not a uh it's a it's almost a no-brainer it's easy to do yeah. and we can all eat eat the right way we can start wearing the right clothes right and we'll solve our problem you know um the next one would be what? The next one uh, would be the chemical pollution of the planet. Okay. okay. That is not directly caused by animal agriculture, but if, when we go vegan, we solve it. That's the beauty of it. Explain because that. Trees are very good at storing the chemical pollution in their trunks. And the way they do that is they suck the water from the ground, and the water has all this chemical pollution because we used up, you know, we poured it all into the environment and it's now sitting in the water. The trees then filter the water. As they pull the water from through the roots up to the leaves, they're filtering it every step of the way, like a carbon filter. Right. And they take all the chemical pollution in the water and they store it in their trunks. And the way I found this out was uh, I was working with these villagers in, uh, in India and uh, the women in the villages used to used to die 80 years younger than the men, hmm. okay, on average. So their life expectancy was eight years less than the life expectancy for the men. And there was a professor who was studying that, who was uh, trying to figure out why this is the case. And he was a social scientist. And uh, he basically finally uh, boiled it down to the fact that the women were the ones who do the cooking in the house, okay? And then he analyzed the, the cooking smoke and he found all kinds of industrial chemicals in the smoke. Ah. It's because the trees had stored all those chemicals in their branches and the women were cutting the branches off and burning them. So he calculated that for every meal that the women were cooking, it was as if they were smoking one pack of cigarettes wow. during the meal. That's the equivalent. So overall, you know, if they're cooking two meals a day, they were smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. Okay. And and so that's when you know I realized that trees actually store the chemicals in their trunks. That's right. 
So if we bring back the three trillion trees that we have cut on the planet and restore them, they can clean up the, our chemical pollution. Then of course we need to start uh, you know, producing less chemical pollution and start being more cognizant of what, what we're doing to the environment. Uh, that's a whole transformation that needs to happen in our industrial processes. But at least the chemical pollution that we have put into the environment can get cleaned up if the world goes vegan. That's one side of it. So we are cleaning up the chemical pollution for the earth. But then we also, when we eat animal foods, all this chemical pollution is coming to us in concentrated doses. Yes. Because the, you know, just like the trees do this, the plants also filter the chemical pollution and store it in their trunk, in their stalks. And when the cows go and eat the entire plant, they're going to get the chemical pollution, right? which they then store in their bodies and uh, and they accumulate. And, and as mammals, we are not very good at cleaning up uh, our pollution. Uh, we are not as half as efficient, not even half, not even 1% as efficient as trees. <laughs> right. You know, we store it in our bodies for the, hours. When people make the mistake of eating fish, the, 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 the Pollution in the ocean bioaccumulates in the fish as the bigger fish eat the smaller fish. Right, right. And it right. just gets worse and worse. Right. Yeah. In the ocean, we are eating like, you know, 10 layers up the hierarchy yeah. uh, food web. So it's, it, so it, we get really high doses of pollution from the ocean if right. we eat fish. But same with the animals, same with cheese, same with dairy. You know, uh, we get, we get, the chemical pollution. So when we stop eating animal foods, we also lower the chemical pollution that we are eating. So it's right. good for us as well as for the planet to bring back the forest. So that's the fourth. Then uh, the the fifth one is nitrogen and phosphorus loading. So Tell which us is, about that. So that comes from the fertilizer we use for growing crops, for industrial crops. And since half the crops are really being grown to feed animals, uh, when we all go vegan, you know, we can reduce that as well. So, so you're sort of everything that is now being violated. We just, we just, you know, uh, pull it down to the green zone uh, right. when we all go vegan. And if we support animal agriculture with our dollars, if we buy organic berries mm -hmm. rather than conventional berries. That means less chemical pollution and less right. of this problem with, right. with nitrogen and phosphorus, right? Yeah. I mean, see, the more we do food for us uh, so that we really don't have to go keep planting like we, uh, you know, agriculture, we just let the forest produce us the food that we need. And it's just a matter of harvesting at that point, right? So rather than harvesting with machines, it'll have to be people who harvest. I say that you know when uh, when you're not um, making unnecessary things, you have plenty of time to go do the harvesting also. Right. So it also I'm, brings contact with nature. Yeah. I'm guessing we're up now to biodiversity. Am I right? That's the number one. The reason it's number one is because all the other transgressions impact biodiversity. In fact, biodiversity just means life as we know it. And these are all the other transgressions are transgressions because they're killing life as we know it, right? Yeah. So life as we know it, uh, we directly kill as well. And that's why it, it is the leading um, planetary boundary violation, planetary boundary transgression. Because it, uh, if we let that, see any one of these transgressions, if we let it fester, it can kill life as we know it. Mm -hmm. Any one of them. And there are six of them, right? And all six of them can be mitigated if we go vegan. This is why I say, obviously, we're going to do it. We are not a stupid species, okay? <laughs> well, you know, that can be argued. <laughs> but let's, let's, let's assume we're not. We are not. I mean, we are being woken up. So we are all being woken up one by one by one by one. Yeah. So nature is doing a really good job. See, to me, nature is the perfect system design. As a system designer, I'm in awe of nature. Okay. Uh, everything is well thought out. It's as if it's been, you know, it's like a, uh, uh, if 
you know, if I were to design something like nature, I mean, my God. <laughs> oh, you'd win a Nobel Prize. For... I know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but so I think of all the work that we have done in system design, you know, like the internet communications work that I was doing. Right. And I'm, I'm saying there's nothing compared to how nature does it. So to me, nature is the perfect system design. And so nature would have figured out how to deal with uh, us when we are recalcitrant. We are, we are finding it hard to give up these things right. when we have to, right? Now, so, you, you've mentioned before that on this path, hmm. you feel like you've been led in different directions. Right. Uh, tell us about that. I've been led, uh, you know, like, see, I thought in 2009, I was in a sanctuary in the Western Ghats of India, and I thought that humans are the only mistake that nature made. Everything else is perfect, right? You just take human beings out and nature recovers. And it's beautiful how life, you know, it's the dance of life. That's, mm -hmm. that's what I was observing in the in that sanctuary and how, uh, uh, how much life there was in the sanctuary when basically you take human beings out of the picture. And that's really what she did, right? She just prevented humans from coming inside and just let the animals come and do whatever they wanted. Now, this was a, was a woman who owned land in India and yeah, it was a couple. It. It, it was a couple from New Jersey, of all places. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Of, of Indian ancestry? One, uh, the husband was of Indian ancestry and, uh, and his wife was, uh, I think she's half Native American and half uh, European descent okay. so so something like that so anyway they they had come there and they had just bought this coffee plantation and they had turned it into this amazing sanctuary okay, by just letting animals be and patrolling the land and making sure that no human being comes inside so so i thought that humans are the only species that there was a mistake in nature everyone else every other species just lives and the planet thrives right and then the next year my granddaughter was born and she immediately convinced me that humans also belong exactly like all the other animals. So it was a, there was a feeling I got, okay, that we belong exactly as we are and that I was a fool for not having understood it. So that's what she kind of conveyed to me. So then I started looking into it and I realized she's right. You know, we do belong exactly as we are because we have been heating the climate for 10,000 years. And in the process, we have prevented the Earth from ever going back another ice age again. So we have ended the Quaternary Ice Age, the fifth major ice age in the Earth's history. We have ended it. So we should be congratulating each other and <laughs> patting each other on the back for having ended the fifth major ice age in the Earth's history. You know, I've got to tell you, in all my life, nobody ever congratulated me for ending the ice age. <laughs> You know, people can be ungrateful sometimes. It's true, right? So we have yeah. done it, okay? Our yeah. ancestors worked so hard to make it happen. Yeah. And we are the first generation to figure this out. See, that's what gives us this uh, tremendous responsibility. We're the first generation to actually figure this out, that we have ended the Quaternary Ice Age. And we're actually you say the last... we're the first to figure it out, but how many, how many people on the planet are aware <laughs> no. that humans ended the ice age not many even though it should be obvious if you think about it we've been in an ice age for for so long and and now you know james hansen has said the, there'll be no more ice age and ice ages until the humans go extinct yeah. what does that mean we have ended it okay yeah. we've ended it and so now we have to congratulate each other and then say now that we are, we are now we now realize we are overheating the planet, mm -hmm. we can figure out how to well if we can heat it up we can actually cool it too. Mm -hmm. So we have the power to heat. If you, then you have the power to cool. Mm -hmm. So how do you cool? Well, that's where the veganism comes in, and that's the vegan movement. You know that's been growing strong, right? Yeah. So I say that everything is in place for us to solve our problem, solve our problems. Okay, everything is in place. And so my granddaughter was born to just slap me awake and say, hey, <laughs> it's right there in front of you. 
you know, look at it this way. Look at it as if we belong exactly as we are and you will see it makes sense. Okay, that's what she convinced me of. And so I say that, you know, she literally changed my life, right? So these are the signs that I get, you know, that uh, has happened to me time and again. And she's the one who who made me give her a pinky promise that the world will be largely vegan by the time, uh, by 2026. That's and in time I, for her sweet 16, right? For her sweet 16, yeah. Right. And uh, she was there at the Oxford Union. She witnessed the debate and she was very happy that we won the debate. Yeah. And so she's seeing these, these you know, uh, critical events happen in our lives, right? So I really think that we are being led. Okay. You know, I mean, I, I'm convinced that we are being led. So this is, gives me tremendous optimism. Not only it's not optimism, it's really realism, right? So it's like I'm saying that uh, this is a perfect system right, that we are in, and we are all actors in that perfect system. That's called nature. And we are all actors. And Mother Nature, trust me, is going to slap us awake, whether we like it or not. <laughs> she's got three more years, okay? So <laughs> she's already doing a great job in 2023. I can tell you that. <laughs> Everything gonna... is going like haywire. And everybody is saying, what? <laughs> Temperature We're going to take a quick roof. break and we'll come back and find out how in the next three years, this world would go vegan. We'll be right back. <laughs> If you want to optimize your health by following a plant-based, low-fat diet, look into the education, events, recipes, exercise, fun, and more provided by the Plant-Based Nutrition Support Group at pbnsg.org. All right, Silish, we've got three years till your granddaughter's 16th birthday, three years to turn the world essentially vegan. How are we going to do it? <laughs> it's storytelling okay it's storytelling and it's actually then implementing new games and rules for the new games because this is how human beings we collaborate and we become so powerful as a species because we tell common stories that everyone buys into the same story and then we play common games okay and that allows us to uh, coordinate our actions Okay. And so the stories we tell today are fairly violent stories. Okay. It's about conquest, who's who won over who. And um, we only remember the conquests. We don't remember the peacemakers. You know? So uh, th and then we play competitive games today. Okay. And, and that's how we have been hitting the climate. Competitive games, meaning in a, in a finite competitive game, there's one winner and all the rest are losers. And we remember the winners. So we're constantly trying to figure out who is stronger than who, who is dominant over who. And in our games, we actually promote deceptions. Because if you can deceive someone and win the game, you will get the most reward. Right? And so we promote deception. And so this is the kind of system that we have created based on deception and domination. And that causes death for the animals, diseases for human beings, and destruction for the planet. And that's how we have been heating the climate. And this is what I call a climate heating system. To create a climate healing system, you have to do the opposite. So we have to do, because, you know, whatever you're doing to heat, do the opposite, you'll start cooling. <laughs> so the opposite is, instead of deception, it should be honesty. Instead of domination, it should be humility. And instead of death, it should be health. Uh, instead of disease, I mean, I'm sorry, death, it should be, you know, happiness, life, right? And then for instead of diseases, it should be health. And instead of destruction, it should be um, harmony. So I call it the five H's from the five D's. Yeah. And so... Creating a system around the five H's is actually a fun thing to do. Mm -hmm. This is an extremely creative time for human beings. Having congratulated each other for ending the fifth, the fifth major ice age in the Earth's history, we can now all get together and figure out new stories and new games. And these games have to be infinite games. 
not finite games. Because finite games, the object of the game is to win the game. The object of an infinite game is to continue the game forever, which is really what sustainability is. Right? Sustainability is about playing the same thing forever, continuing life as we know it forever. So we should be now creating infinite games and playing infinite games. And I say that, why wouldn't you participate in something so creative? Why wouldn't we want to do that? Of course we would. Okay, So we just have to force it to people like that. And so it's telling new stories, you know, and, and then playing new games that would allow us to um, get to where we need to go, you know, which is vegan world by 2026. I mean, I say largely vegan world by 2026, then we are on the way to recovering on the planet. All right. right. Well, let me be cynical for a moment. Mm -hmm. We live in a culture where people watch television and they see the commercials for McDonald's and Wendy's right. and these unhealthy fast food mm -hmm. operations. And it's part of the culture that people go to these fast food places. The statistics are overwhelming, so I've blocked them right. out. But so many times per week, so many millions right. of times per week, this is where Americans go. Now you want to tell these healthier stories, these stories mm. of sustainability, these stories of health. But how do we get it into the heads of these people who think that they should go to Chick-fil-A for lunch? How, how I don't focus on those. Happen? Yeah, see, I don't focus on those who are going to Chick-fil-A for lunch. I focus on those who are willing to listen first, you know? So focus on them. And you only need to get to maybe you know a quarter of the people at most. You know, I mean, even if you get to a quarter of the people, you've gone. I mean, you clearly are going to win this race, okay? Um, because it turns out that fifty percent of the people on the planet just go along with the flow. They don't mind whatever, whichever way the planet goes, they go. You know, the rest of the people are doing this; they go this way. They go that way; they go that way. So fifty percent of the people are just following, right? the trend it's so it's it's the trendsetters that you have to convince the elites the people who are like the oxford union right you have to convince yeah. them and get them to come on board so we have to convince the people who are conscious and then we could rely on the conscious people if there are enough of them to move the less conscious people yeah people come along a lot of people come along and there'll be some who will stick to their guns and they will never give up Right. It's fine. And, you know, uh, that right. uh, eventually it will become like, you know, people will look down upon it and it, uh, right. eventually it will go away. Right. Right. So to me, it's oh. like it's a progression of morality. One thing that gives me a little bit of hope is that animal agriculture is so inherently inefficient, mm -hmm. so absurd that we we grow crops and then we feed them to the animals, and then we eat the animals. And the, the amount of water it uses and the amount of land it uses, it's just an inherently, absurdly inefficient system. Right. But it's being propped up by government subsidies. Right. And if enough people of the conscious people will stop eating animal products, if we can get to that 25% that you're talking about, the economics of animal agriculture will fail once they start to lose 20, 30% of their market. Their, yeah. their, their margins are slim enough now, even with all the help of the government subsidies. So, yeah. and of course, if we could stop the government subsidies, that would destroy animal agriculture too absolutely so, so we should all work to try to end animal subsidies to uh, federal subsidies to animal agriculture but at the same time if we could just cut demand by 20 or 30 percent that industry will fail yeah see if you think about it you know right now the dairy industry is already losing like crazy okay yeah uh, it's being propped up by the government Right. It's being propped up by government, basically by 
you know, printing money. I mean, they can do the printing here in the U.S., but other countries, they're hurting okay, because they have to prop it up with tax dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> in the U.S., fortunately, you know, we can print because other countries are buying our debt. You know, we have no intention of paying back the debt. <laughs> and I think everybody is beginning to see it now. <laughs> so it's a highly unsustainable system, right? And it's so, uh, and the good thing about this system is that you don't have to make it go down to zero. You don't have to kill it. You just have to make it stop growing. As soon as you make it stop growing, it dies. <laughs> Because it's so dependent on growth, right? So we have to then, you know, put in place the alternate systems, the alternate games, and the alternate stories that we tell. We have to, we need to put that in place um, before the old system dies. So this is why I say that's the job for the next three years for us to design the new system and put it in place and start playing it. Okay, so that uh, you have a smooth transition to a new way of living right? Uh, for those who are going to have to give up on the old one. Right. right? And so to me, it is, it's, a, it's a great time to be alive, you know? And so I, when I look at the positive side of it, so I also believe that whatever we focus on amplifies in nature. So if you keep focusing on the negative, we amplify that. And I say, let's focus on the positive and amplify that. And that allows us to realize our vision easier. Well, Silas, you are optimism incarnate, which <laughs> is why I enjoy talking to you. Um, you are now a proponent of health. You lead a healthy life yourself. Mm -hmm. Your whole mindset is as healthy as the mindset of anyone I know. Um, but you weren't always that way. You used to apparently smoke cigarettes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's something I have trouble envisioning. Um, so tell us your story about smoking cigarettes, when you did it, and how you stopped. Yeah, see, I started smoking when I was in college, okay, because everyone was smoking around me, and I started smoking with them, and I got hooked very quickly. Was, was this at Stanford? No, no, way before Stanford. It was at, in India. Okay. At IIT. And... Um, and then, you know, I didn't tell my parents. Um, I, when I came to the U.S. to do my higher studies, I was still smoking. Then I finally wrote to my mother because I wanted to get it off my chest. I, wanted, I didn't want to keep a secret from her. So I wrote to my mother and she got very upset. You know, she wrote me this long letter explaining my birth and how I was a very sickly child that I used, that I was a twin. And my twin actually passed away at birth. Oh. And uh, and I barely survived, and that uh, she had to massage oil on my chest because I couldn't breathe. Now, before you got this letter, did you know that you had been a twin? No, I had no idea. Wow. I had no idea. So it's the first time I was told, you know, that she told me this, and uh, and that uh, so until the age of two, I used to have you know trouble breathing. And she said, you are the last person who should be smoking. <laughs> After all the trouble I went through with getting you to survive. And so she was on my case after that. Okay, She would bug me. Every time I called her, she would bug me and ask me, have you quit smoking? And I would tell her, I'm trying. I really am. And I did try. I tried all kinds of things. I tried nicotine gum and tried patches. I tried... You name it. You know, anything newfangled that came, I would try it. Because I really wanted to quit. But I didn't do it. I couldn't do it. Yeah. The, the addiction to nicotine, nicotine was too strong? Was too strong for me. And uh, I remember I even uh, went for hypnosis. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I successfully quit for like two weeks during hypnosis, after hypnosis. And, uh, but then there was some stress at work and I went back to smoking. Okay. Um, so I always associated smoking with re stress relief. Um, so then uh, in uh, 1997, February, my mother passed away in her sleep. You know, uh, she had a heart attack and she was only 60 years old. 
And, and I was devastated because that's the only thing she ever asked me to do. Quit smoking, right? So I went to my doctor and I said, I, you know, help me out. I really, this time, I mean, I really want to do this for my mother, in memory of my mother. Uh, and so he gave me something called Zyban. So it was like a tablet. And it's, uh, it's like an antidepressant, I think. And he said, take this tablet and continue smoking. And 40% of the people will quit uh, eventually. But I only took it like one day, you know. And I quit. And I never touched it again. And, and I even it had nothing and, to do with the tablet, right? It had nothing to do with the tablet. I went and gave all the tablets back to the doctor. And I said, I don't, don't need this anymore. So just uh, give it to someone else as... Uh, as uh, as samples and and i really think that all along i had the capacity to quit i just didn't have the the mindset to quit you know to see through see through what it was doing to me and i tell this story because right now our mother earth is telling us to quit quit killing animals you know uh, it's an addiction and it, again uh this time I do not want to wait until my mother dies before I before we overcome yeah. our addiction. Okay, we always have the capacity to overcome our addiction, and uh, it's it's coming together as as a community and and helping each other quit. Okay, yeah. I didn't have that kind of support when I was trying to quit. I wish I had, you know. But anyway. Um, so to me, it was a sim it was symbolic that that happened to me, so yeah. that I can now tell this story to people saying, "Our Mother Earth is telling us to quit." Right. Okay. She's slapping us around, saying, "Quit." And we can pretend all we want that it's not animal agriculture; it's only fossil fuels. But you know, you know, there are six planetary boundaries, and all six of them are yelling at you to quit animal agriculture. Right. So. Uh, so let's not uh, come come up with excuses for not quitting. Let's figure out how to help each other quit. Yeah. Um, do you see any progress in the international scientific community in recognizing that animal agriculture is the leading cause of climate change and all those other transgressions? See, the other transgressions, it's easy to get people to agree. Okay, because the way the system has tried to portray this, they're, they've conceded on the other five. But they're saying, that's not the major issue. The major issue is climate change. They're trying to focus our mind on just climate change and then trying to focus our mind on just fossil fuels for climate change so that we can all go along with this growth, the green growth story, right? right. It's, a, it's a con job that they're trying to do. <laughs> You know, I mean, as a systems engineer, I, I've seen through these things so many times before. Okay, people trying to con me into accepting somebody's patent, you know, <laughs> as the best solution for something. And I say, excuse me, no, I know it's not. <laughs> so try another one. Look, it's we know, they all know. The scientists who have been working on this know that animal agriculture is the leading cause of almost every known environmental ill on the planet. Okay? They all know. Well, they just, then why, why will, they cannot why say will it. none of them say it? They cannot say it. If they say it, they get ostracized. They don't get their funding. So it's the system that is keeping us all, you know, tied, imprisoned, and frog-marched. Like, we are all being factory farmed, okay? Yeah. Even the scientists are being factory farmed. Yeah. Uh, frog marched into going along with the prevailing story. Yeah. Okay, and uh, and it takes a bit of courage, and and also a devil may care attitude. You know <laughs> that I don't care if I lose my funding. Can how many people can say that? Right. So we are lucky that we can say that. You know, I don't care if someone people don't fund me. Because I'm willing to do this work without any funding. Have you heard the climate scientist Michael Mann speak? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He seems like such a nice fellow. Right. And he's well informed on the climate. 
But I, I've never heard him mention animal agriculture. Yeah, see, they, they have, you know, they cooked up these conventions on how to measure and how certain things are going to be ignored, okay? Because nature is compensating for it anyway. So we don't have to worry about it. Until, of course, nature stops compensating for it. Then you have to worry about it. <laughs> so uh, they call it part of the natural cycle. And, you know, the first thing that occurred to me when I, was, when I started looking at climate change and the climate change science literature is that, you know, as an engineer, if someone comes and tells me, this action causes CO2, this action causes CO2, this action causes CO2, I say, well, all actions have to be counted. Okay. If you say, well, this action is part of the natural cycle, I said, wait a minute. In nature, is there something that goes and bottom trawls the ocean? Right. I mean, how is that part of the natural cycle? They, they, they call the natural cycle things like the fact that animals breathe out carbon dioxide yeah. and trees breathe it in. But there used to be six trillion trees, now there are three trillion. There right. didn't used to be 1.5 billion cows or right. a total of what is it something like 25 billion farmed animals at any given right. time so if we get to the point where there are 100 billion farmed animals and there's one tree is it still the natural cycle at what <laughs> point do they wake up and say no there's nothing about this that's natural at all yeah i mean it's about taking responsibility for our own actions okay yeah. And I, I mean, I really believe, you know, as an engineer, I'd say everything that you do, if you are doing it and you can change it, I want to count that because right. that's a potential solution right there. Right. Right. So if you're breeding animals and they're putting all the CO2 through their noses, you have to count it. It's you're responsible for bringing the animals into the world. Right. If those animals were not there, that vegetation will still be there in the ground. Right. Which means all that sequestration that nature did would be, you know, reversing climate change instead of being emitted through the nose of an animal. Right. Right. So everything has to be counted. Right. When someone says these don't have to be counted, I immediately put them as either corrupted or incompetent. Yeah. Okay. Two categories. That's the only right. two categories you can go into. Right, so, because the leading factor, the leading reason why animal agriculture is the number one cause of climate change is what we call carbon opportunity cost. Mm -hmm. It's what the world would look like if people weren't foolish enough to chop down forests, to eat burgers, to give themselves heart attacks. So what the world would look like would be trillions more trees, a lot more vegetation, healthier soil, uh, healthier oceans, right, and um, and therefore so much more carbon sequestration that it dwarfs anything that that uh, the fossil fuel burning does. Right. Yeah. So my calculation shows that if we just uh, go vegan, uh, you you will see the climate cooling, even though you're doing all the other activities exactly as we do today. Right. Okay. And of course, we don't have to keep doing all the other activities exactly as we do today. If we start regulating that, if we start reducing that, it'll cool even faster. Yeah. So that's up to you, how fast you want to cool. But you can start the cooling by just going vegan first. Right. Okay? And uh, that's what my calculations are showing. And my they're based on just simple engineering, you know, competent engineering, where I'm counting everything. I start counting everything. And it's part of... Uh, what humans are contributing. And so I'm assuming that the, all the compensation that nature is doing today, it will continue to do. <laughs> when we stop emitting, when it, even when we don't emit these things, it will continue to do that. Okay, which means uh, it's a, you know, we get a double dividend, so to speak. You're not emitting mm -hmm. this and that sequestration still happens. Yeah. Bill Gates in his book on climate change uh, discuss the possibility of uh, ending animal agriculture, of not eating meat. And he dismissed it because he said, eating meat is so important to our cultural holidays. <laughs> so he, he's willing to give up on the world 
because of the importance of the turkey at Thanksgiving or the burger on July 4th. It's, it's, it's a kind of closed-mindedness that's just breathtaking to me. What is so hard about having Thanksgiving, being grateful, without having a dead, abused bird at the center of the table? I have no idea what's hard about that. Yeah, no, it'll happen, you know. I mean, it is already happening in a lot of households, and it'll happen in a lot more households year after year. And it, uh, so by 2026, I'm expecting, you know, half the households will have uh, non turkey Thanksgiving. Okay. Good. Yeah. So that's um, my goal. Yeah. So we can what, what are the catalysts in the next three years? We've got three years hmm. roughly till your, your granddaughter's sweet 16. What are the catalysts in the next three years that are going to move us forward as a species to cool the climate? Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I think it will be um, nature. So I expect what happened in 2023. 2023 was off the charts. Um, you know, I mean, if in you look at all storms, the other years. Droughts, yeah, storms, fire. droughts, floods, all those things, like, Chennai went through. So a that's going to get worse. It's going to get much worse. So meaning every year, it's like an amplification is going to happen. And people are going to say, hey, you know, there's something we need to do differently, right? So at some point, the governments will have to get involved, okay? Because if the governments don't get involved, they just continue to go along, then they're going to kill us. They're going to kill themselves too. It's not just us. So they're going to kill themselves too. And so I really think that the governments at some point are going to give up. And because they've had 30 years of trying to make incremental changes and it has gone exactly nowhere, yeah. right? In fact, it's gone exactly in the wrong direction. So I say that at some point, you know, the corruption and the, and the mismanagement, the miscalculation and all these things are becoming increasingly self-evident that everybody is getting fed up with what is happening in the uh, in the UN processes, right? In all the UN meetings. So I remember, you know, that I have an example in India where uh, the Kolkata Metro was done just like the UN cops are being done, right? It's all completely corrupt. People are making taking bribes, and it wasn't getting built. And so the cost of the metro was 12 times the budget. And, you know, and it was rife with political meddling. And the, it was delayed like crazy. So it's like 20 years for the first trains to come out. And, you know, it was a mess. And then when they did the Delhi metro in India, they gave the engineers who were doing the job full autonomy told them they'll be free of political interference. But they don't have to listen to anybody. They have the power to do whatever they wanted. It came in under budget, finished ahead of time, and 99.97% of the trains arrive within one minute of scheduled time. It's the second busiest metro in the world. Wow. Okay. That's an example of, of letting people do their job with integrity and we can solve problems as human beings. We have done this so many times. Okay, So are we serious about solving climate change? That's the question for the governments. Are we serious about solving climate change and are we serious about the sustainable development goals? If you're serious about them, let the professionals do the job. Okay? Give them freedom to do the job without political interference and it will get done okay so well, how would that work exactly let's say that we could convince the government to let you and a hundred colleagues you choose do the job oh yeah, yeah thousands you know i mean it's not just you know Thou it, with thousands of colleagues yeah but what you've got to do is shut down an industry shut down lots of industries. Right? It's not just one industry. There are lots of things that we are doing that we need to change. We need to change um, how much pollution we are pouring into the environment every year. So we need to change our education system to so that students are not being taught 
this is how you build this process. This is how you build this machine. And because it's full of toxic chemicals that you're pouring into the environment when you do that. So you have to change education. So right now we have an education system that says this is how we normally do things. And then we have a separate center for sustainability where we teach people how to do it sustainably. I said, if you have a separate center for sustainability in your educational institution, it's an admission that all the other things you're teaching children are unsustainable. Okay, sustainability should be built into the education system, into every educational system um, uh, curriculum, right? So it's it's about changing everything, and that's where I would focus. I would focus on the education system first. I would focus on uh, you, you know these making the right things more affordable. So you know providing subsidies for organic agriculture providing subsidies for healthy food being provide, being made available to people. So focus first on the health of humanity. Okay, That's what I would do. If I, if I were an engineer and people ask me, how would you start with this? This is how I would start. Okay? Education system and healthy food and health of people being taken care of first. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are not so hard to do, no. right? Those are not so hard to do. And then the rest will come. You know, so it's like you 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 take the first right steps, and then others will come along and say, "I can help you. I can let's do the other stuff." Yeah, because I have seven strategic actions that we need to be doing, but these are the two most important actions. Okay, well, let's hope that day comes soon. <laughs> we have three years. We don't want to disappoint your granddaughter. <laughs> no, it'll happen. Yeah, because uh, like I like I told you, it's always happened to me. You know, some this magic, this magic in the air. All right, we'll let that be the last word. Thank you, Silish, for joining us. You can uh, please check out his website at climatehealers.org. Subscribe to his newsletter. Um, also check out realmeneatplants.com. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel. And we'll see you soon. Thank you, Silas. This has been the Glenn Mercer Show, where everyone listening turns vegan, regains their health, and annoys their friends and relatives. Find us on YouTube at the Glenn Mercer Show and across all your major podcast platforms. Don't forget to subscribe. <laughs>